All right, so I'll start the ball rolling, but please do feel free, to, if you have questions, come down to these mics. We want to hear from you. We hear amongst ourselves all the time. So my first question is to Kate. Kate, is there any advice you would give to other kids or teenagers who have been recently diagnosed with autism or struggling with what this diagnosis means for them? Well, when I was first diagnosed, I, as I said, really didn't know what it meant. And when I tried to research it, I just found dozens of articles that just, they didn't really describe what I was feeling or what I was dealing with. Then one day my mom gave me this book that said, um, The Rules of Autism for Teenage Girls. As I read it, I was like, but none of this applies to me. And why should I change myself to fit the rules in these books? So I think that, um, the best thing to do, for me anyways, was to talk to people who had similar experiences to me and to remember that I don't have to conform to anything anyone says, to just be myself. Adrienne, um, there's a lot of press and hype about brain training programs. Is there any truth and basis for all of that, or is it just hype? Brain training programs, like... Uh, if you, can, you can go on the web and people can make a lot of money uh, uh, how to advance their, their memory, their, uh, their learning capacity. Is, do they just need better sleep patterns? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. No, there's a lot of, I mean, uh, there's a lot of truth in like, you know, how you can train your brain constantly. There's a lot of hype also, like many people selling products, uh, you know, whatnot, you name it, that basically are meant to enhance your uh, cognitive capacities. And of course, they're not that all that effective. Um, and talking more, you know, precisely about sleep, there's a lot of tools coming up now that basically will enhance, you know, memory functions during sleep. By, for example, um, detection, like online detection of brain states, and then like playing certain sounds at certain, or playing some light patterns on your eyes, so that apparently that could enhance memories. And I'm not sure, I'm not totally sure it's actually true. Uh, there's a lot of research to do still, uh, but you know, um, when people can sell stuff, they will build it and sell it. So no, I would say, of course, brain training programs. I mean, you know, this is kind of obvious. It's like, of course, you need to use your brain as much as possible. Exercising, uh, as we heard before, absolutely as well, but you know, Learn a new, playing a new instrument, you know, and learn a foreign language in your 50s or 60s. There's nothing better for your brain than doing this kind of thing, so. Use it or lose it. Um, Blake, th this, this could equally go, I think, to, to uh, anybody in the, in the group, but uh, tell me more about uh, um, cognitive maps, how the brain works to organize, the ex uh, relate to the external world, uh, map the outside world, re re uh, capture information. I I'm thinking particularly of uh, uh, savants. How do, how do their brains differ from what we call, quote, the normal brain? Excuse me for using that term, Kate. But how, what is it that the brain can do? Uh, some people can remember pi for uh, 10,000 digits, or they, can remember, they have eidetic memory. They, they never forget anything. How, how can that work in some people but not everybody? Well, that's uh, an interesting question because um, it touches upon another area of research that I've engaged in in my career that led myself and some of my colleagues to a somewhat, um, let's say, surprising conclusion that uh, many people don't intuit, which is that um, it is actually good to forget sometimes. And it is a benefit to your ability to make decisions to forget some things. So what we've found um, is that in fact, your brain seems to actively erase some of your memories. Now there are some people who don't experience this. There's a syndrome called uh, highly superior autobiographical memory syndrome where uh, people, according to all the tests that have been run on them, seem to literally remember everything that has ever happened to them. And they describe it as an impairment. 
it is not a benefit to them. It means that they are constantly recalling things that they don't want to be recalling. You'll be there taking a test, and instead you're remembering the color of the shoes that your friend wore in kindergarten, something like that. So um, through a series of, of neuros neuroscience and also computational modeling studies, my group and others have shown that indeed, although obviously it's bad to forget too much, some amount of forgetting is beneficial and your brain actively engages in forgetting probably for that reason. Now, back to your question, why do some people have this? We don't fully know, but it would be not unreasonable to speculate that for whatever reason, their brain is not successfully erasing some of their memories in the same way that other people's brains do. And as I noted, this, though it might sound like something you'd want, is not something you'd actually want. Too much memory is actually a bad thing in the same way that too little memory is as well. It, it, it's worth pointing out that, that uh, the, the brain in, in infants is massively overconnected, and a normal part of brain development is to, is to prune away lots of those unneeded connections, and that's related to uh, what uh, brain, what uh, Blake and what indeed what Kate was talking about, the inability to tune out large parts of the external world and focus on the, the single person in the room in a, in a party conversation. So uh, we have a question over there. Hey, <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for your talks, they were very interesting. Um, I found very fascinated uh, the part about the neural networks uh, that were able to predict or yeah to make these space maps. And I'm just wondering what kind of neural networks are those? Are those like convolutional neural networks that are kind of like going through space or how do you train them? Like, uh, yeah, just super interesting. Okay, so we've got someone with a bit of expertise in the audience here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a convolutional neural network, which she referenced, is a particular type of artificial neural network that's generally used for vision tasks. In the research that I was talking about here, we used a very simple recurrent neural network, in fact. So that just means that we have a group of these simulated neurons that are all connected to one another in a big jumble, as it were. Um, there was no other additional structure that we added to it. But one of the things that we're interested in exploring, and which I think many people would predict, is that you can get even more sophisticated types of imagination from more sophisticated neural network architectures. And indeed, within artificial intelligence research, that's exactly what people find. A follow-up question. Um, is the amount of training uh, to the neural networks like how does that compare with like uh, a human like do you really need like extensive training or are they able to maybe because i don't know do it faster than maybe a human has to be at one place like several times in order to create those mem memories spatial that's things. a great question so um the reason it's a great question is because Actually, these artificial neural networks right now do not learn as efficiently as the human brain. They require many more experiences within these simulated environments to form these maps. We could postulate that that's in part because a human being is already working off of the basis of their entire lifetime of experience, in addition to whatever else evolution has provided with them with genetically. Um, but I think that this is one of the areas that people are really interested in artificial intelligence and exploring is how can we m minimize the amount of training required to get these networks to exhibit these kinds of structures. Cool. Thank you very much. If, if I may oh. add something to it, like what is fascinating about it is that in the hippocampus, there's a map of the environment that exists from the very first second you enter a new environment. So it's already somehow pre-wired. It's already there. It's going to be, be modified. And we have no clue of like, how it happens. If it's like, basically from birds that you have this predefinite amount of like, possible maps that already exist, is it sleep that actually you know, kind of shuffling a bit the connection so that there's a new map for the next day that is available? These are totally open questions. Cool. Thank you. So it's a related question, uh, uh, Blake. How far are we from being able to 
simulate the human brain and its, its disorders. I'm thinking, for instance, of autism. We just discussed uh, autism as perhaps being the ASD spectrum is characterized by overconnectivity. Can, can we model that yet with AI? Um, we're working towards that, but we're still probably a good, like fairly far away from that goal. Um, one of the issues is just the sheer size of the human brain. So the, the human brain contains roughly 80 to 100 billion neurons um, with more synaptic connections, more connections between the neurons than there are stars in the galaxy. Uh, simulating that in a computer is actually a big ask. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, no, the understatement even with of the year. today's then. modern computers. And, and even the most advanced artificial intelligence systems are still a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than the, the real human brain. So that's in addition to just all of the things we still have to understand about the brain to accurately simulate it. But people are working towards it, and so, I think it will be within our lifetimes that we can see that. All right, so we, we don't have to worry about the... the uh AI taking over anytime soon. <laughs> Not in my opinion, <laughs> though I have colleagues who disagree with me yeah. about that. We have, a, we, have a, we have a question here. Um, can the brain imagine someone or something that it's never saw? Like, not just a giraffe with swings, like someone that's never saw a picture or just crossed on the road. So, so I, uh, I'll start with the answer to that one. Um, it's a good question. You can imagine things that you've never seen before, but I think what's very hard for us to do is to imagine things that have no relationship to what we've ever seen before. So even if you imagine something you've never seen before, it will still be like a person or an animal or a tree or a house. To actually imagine something well, it's almost impossible for us to even talk about it, right? Like, what would it be to think in your head of something that is, bears no relationship whatsoever to anything you've ever seen before? That we probably can't do, except in those moments where our brain's not even working properly, and then it will just, we won't even know how to interpret it. That's what artists do. They actually manage to imagine things that basically do not exist yet. And they yes. invent something that seems so obvious in retrospect, like Picasso, right? Cubism, and suddenly it's like, of course, but he was the first one to think about it. Music is the same. Hi, my question is with respect to sleep. So, is there a difference in sleep, for example, if someone sleeps in a dark room, horizontal, no lights, no electronics on, is that sleep better than perhaps sleeping, sitting up with the TV on, lights on, noise in the room? Oh, it would absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, How, how much better? Please put curtains, you know, in your kids' bedrooms. <laughs> in your own bedroom, like darkness, of course, is really important. Be comfortable. Um, there are multiple obvious reasons for that, right? But like a good night of sleep, uninterrupted sleep, with as less you know, external stimulation as possible, this will let your brain actually do the kind of thing that is you know, supposed to do during sleep. Right. Even it, if the person is sleeping with the lights on, the TV on, and all the noise. But then it will like, wake up like, many, many times because of like, something, and it will go back. But these interruptions are detrimental for all the cognitive functions during sleep. So it's extremely important and and even more important like you've you, I'm sure you heard about like how much sleep should we have every night and some people say it's eight hours no it's only seven like, that doesn't actually matter too much we're all very different if you feel well after let's say six hours of sleep and you feel like you feel that you can do everything you should do fine you're lucky good for you However, now we know that what is the most important thing is like to sleep at very regular times. Don't jet lag yourself by basically going to sleep two hours later or earlier than usual. Um, so that is what is like, you know, health hygiene, yes, very important. Next question here. I'm curious as to um, how, when we sleep, you said that the, um, our brain decides on the memories it wants to keep, you know? 
I'm curious as to the criteria it uses, you know? <laughs> is, it, is it based on the emotions we felt or what is it, you know? Because no, we're used to using criteria. <laughs> uh, that's uh, a, a billion dollar question. <laughs> Literally. That's a great question. <laughs> uh, and this is like, you know, me and many, many other researchers working on this. Uh, we have some cues. There are um, modulators associated with rewards, for example, the dopamine, I'm sure you, some of you heard about it, that when it's released during uh, wakefulness, because you get a reward, then you get a basically tag, you know, this, this, and all the neurons that were activated from where you started to the point where you got the reward, they're going to be tagged so that they're going to be replayed again and again, more than others during sleep. And we think that this process is instrumental for, like, for solidifying, solidifying this particular memory more than others. But we know also that the system can go wrong. You know, um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, we think, is actually the brain associating so much emotional power to this memory. It's going to be replayed again and again. So now we have to find ways, strategies, to actually go against that. We don't know how. Like, there are people working on perhaps some, of course, drugs, medication, or other things. But, but yes, it's, it's, but it's the most important question to ask, and it's really complicated. Uh, so I've been reading a book by Peter Atiyah. I'm not sure if you're familiar. He's an MD who focuses on longevity. And he, um, he talks, one of his chapters is actually on sleep, and he discusses this concept about how some people are naturally uh, like early birds and some people are innately more night owls. Can you speak to that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a strong genetic component to it. It also varies along your life, uh, lifetime. Uh, like teenagers uh, usually uh, wake up like naturally later. So it's an absurdity that in our society school starts at 8 a.m. It's like adults really, you know, imposing their views on what life should be to young kids. And it's, it's, it's a disaster, really. Uh, and I mean, I'm talking about like, yes, <laughs> there, are, there are researchers at uh, the University of Montreal here. I know them very well. They're fighting actually with the ministry to say that they should basically delay the start of school by at least one hour. Because if we're talking about kids, they are totally off uh, in terms of like sleep schedule. They are like the first hour in the classroom is really hard. So, yeah. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, as you say, many people, very different uh, schedules. Why? We know there's some genetics to that. Yeah, yeah no, that's... Um, he was actually... That's great. Thank you for your answer. He was, and he was also alluding... So he said some of those things, but he was also alluding to the fact that um, there could be, like, could have been a, um, an evolutionary advantage to it. Like, when our ancestors were hunters and gatherers, and, you know, some people would have to, like, guard the tents while everybody else was sleeping, right? So that's kind of why we, he says we evolved that way. I don't so know. So should we be sleep typical or sleep divergent? I mean, <laughs> sleep divergent. You want, you want diversity. <laughs> that's yeah. the point, I yeah. think. Well, no. speaking, of, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. speaking of diversity, it, it does it, it hurt me. We should be bringing out the fact that uh, it, it, neurodiverse populations, maybe in, in some respects, some performance metrics, they are less uh, able. But they're in other domains, they are more able. And I'm just wondering, Kate, if you had in the, either in your own experience or in, or in uh, your friend's experience, that there are tasks that you can do that other kids in the class cannot do. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I find, for me, um, it's, I can remember the just most absurd facts. It's just information of th pertaining to things that I'm interested in. So science, math, I don't have to study at all. And I get 90s. But French verbs, I just... <laughs> And I also think it helps when the uh, things... There you go, looking for logic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> things that make sense to me, I find, are so much easier to pick up. But, for example, French verbs, there are all these exceptions. And... No. <laughs> Fascinating. There's a question over there. Yeah, another sleep question I have. Uh, so if we improve sleep, can we cure disease? So, yeah, it's a great question. Of course, at some level. Uh, I would take actually the question perhaps the other way around. There's none 
there is not a single neurological disorder that is not associated with a sleep disorder. And actually, in many cases, sleep disorders precede the first real cognitive decline by sometimes 10 to 20 years. So, meaning that if your spouse, partner, or someone tells you that you're behaving weirdly in the bed, like moving a lot, this kind of thing, you need to consult. It's really important. And now, actually, we're piecing these things together, understanding what is happening. But yes, overall, sleep hygiene is so important, of course. Like you've, and for everything, not only the brain, right? For your body, for vascular disease and, and heart disease, everything, everything. Yes, absolutely. So it is the holy grail. I think so, and I think we, we are living through a pandemic of, you know, um, of, of bad sleep habit, and I am, you know, the first victim of this. Like cell phones and, and, and work and travel, all this is affecting our sleep, and this basically will pay the price at some point. And do you think the studies 20 years from now will look back at this and we can make that connection? And maybe oh, we're... The connections are already made, so like little by little, of, of course. Uh, and and like there are you know, population, uh, uh, population studies showing that, yes, like a sleep, a good sleep is associated with usually with better you know, aging. Yes, so when is the, the best sleep? At what time have you, through your studies, have you realized when people are reaching or getting to the point of good sleep? So that's a good question. I think there's some diversity. I, I, actually, I, I'm not a super, like, very expert on this question, but I would say, like, go to sleep when you're asleep, you know, sleepy. Uh, Are you uh, suffering from sleep anxiety? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, there is, if you, and if you have trouble sleeping, now there are, like, you know, cognitive therapies that are extremely efficient of like solving these issues you know so so no so if you if you if you kind of like find yourself like not sleeping at night go and consult they will that there's a help uh, and, and and it's very efficient it works okay Thank you. I'm Thank going you. to have to uh, stop and we, we could talk for hours I know <laughs> First of all, like thank our speakers. Uh, as I said, they're, they're, they're available at the reception. There are more questions that you can ask afterwards. Uh, I think the message is clear. It's what your parents told you when you were growing up. Eat right, sleep right, and, and exercise. Exercise. It's not rocket science. So thank you very much, everybody.